In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me and that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins, for the grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. As we do so many times in our prayer in your presence, Lord, we listen to your words. We listen to the words that you spoke to your disciples. We listen to the words that you spoke to your apostles. And we make them our own. Just yesterday, the church celebrated the Sunday of the Word of God. And it's a reminder that the Word of God, as Scripture puts it, is living and active. That it's a Word that's filled with God's life, that's filled with God's Spirit, and therefore can have an impact on on my life, on your life. And we read today, Lord, in your presence, words that you spoke to the apostles during a particularly difficult time, a difficult time in your journey on earth and a difficult time in their journey with you in their role as your disciples, as your apostles. And this time was the Last Supper. Our Lord knew that he would be facing the passion. His agony in the garden was just a few hours away and his passion and death was going to take place the next day. And it was difficult for the apostles. They sensed how our Lord was acting and the way events had been unfolding, that our Lord's conflict with the authorities was coming to a climax, that something was going to happen. And they could sense from our Lord's demeanor, and perhaps some of them who were a little bit brighter, knew that this would entail suffering, this would entail some great contradiction for our Lord. And precisely in that context, our Lord, as St. John records in chapter 14, says this to the apostles, and we let him say it to us in our time of prayer. Our Lord says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. And so this is our Lord's answer. This is our Lord's response. This is his solution, so to speak, to situations in which our hearts are troubled. The response is trust, trust in him. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. You trust in God, trust also in me. And this has to be, of course, a living trust, Lord. This has to be something, Jesus, that we practice, that we exercise. Because it's not that our Lord is saying that there there won't be things in our lives that cause a great consternation, that there won't be problems or obstacles that make us suffer, that there won't be threats or uncertainty which makes us which make us anxious. It's not that we won't have serious problems of all types. Rather, our Lord is saying, when these things happen, face them in a certain way. Face face them with your faith. Live through them with your faith. Accept them with your faith. And perhaps above all, interpret them with trust in God and trust in me. Understand what is happening with your faith. And what does that tell us? Our faith always tells us God is here. And therefore we can respond, Lord, what do you want of me in this situation? However difficult it may be, however threatening it may be, God is here. Lord, what do you want to help me to do, to accept, to change in this situation that you've put me in? Because you're here with me. In the same Gospel of John, in the same setting, Jesus says, In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so just like the apostles and our Lord were in this difficult time when our Lord told them these things, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So too many of us, if not all of us, are going through a time of 
of uncertainty, a time of certain difficulties that perhaps we didn't have a year ago, a year and a half ago. And our Lord wants us to confront it with faith, wants us to confront it with trust. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. A better translation for that is actually, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. The word being translated there as good courage or good cheer is the Greek verb tharseo in a in a New, Te- New Testament concordance we read the following about the word tharseo what does it mean in greek tharseo emboldened to show courage this refers to god bolstering the believer empowering them with a bold inner attitude to be of good courage for the believer tharseo showing boldness is the result of the Lord infusing his strength by his inworking of faith, showing this unflinching, unflinching, bold courage means living out the inner confidence and inner bolstering that is produced by the Spirit. And so this, this courage that our Lord talks about, be of good cheer, be of good courage, for I have overcome the world, is the result of faith. And faith Part of faith is the conviction, the conviction that we have in God's goodness. You trust God, trust also in me. And the conviction that God is all-powerful and that God is good gives us courage. It lets us take heart in in spite of tribulation, in spite of threatening situations, in spite of uncertainty. And what is courage? Courage is the, the, the virtue of acting well in spite of fear. Acting well in spite of being afraid. Sometimes we think of the courageous person as the fearless person, the person who fears nothing and, there, and therefore can do all sorts of daring things in difficult circumstances. But that's not courage. If you're fearless, there's no merit in acting well in difficult circumstances. The courageous man, the courageous person, is someone who can act well even though he or she is afraid. Acting well in spite of being anxious. In one of his epistles, St. John says something similar. He says, This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. This is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. So, Lord Jesus, we can ask you in this time of prayer, as the disciples asked you, Lord, increase my faith. Give me this attitude of Tharseo. Embolden me from within. Help me to realize that you have overcome the world, the world with all of its troubles, with all of its challenges, with all of its sadness, with all of its suffering. But this is tricky. This is tricky because it really has to be faith. And faith is not something we feel. Faith is not emotional. Faith is not physical. It's something we, not something we can feel or see. Rather, Hebrews describes it precisely as the conviction of things unseen. What does that mean? It means we don't see the victory of Christ. It, it can seem at times like he's failing, like the church is failing, like my own Christian life is failing. We don't see his victory over the world. We don't see his plan, especially in dark times, especially in times of worry, times of uncertainty. We don't see or feel him with us in those moments. But because we have faith, we believe it. We're convinced of it. And so this is something that happens in our intellect and our will at a deep level beyond the senses and beyond emotions. As St. Paul says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk through the troubles of this life, we walk through the challenge of this life by faith, by our conviction in things that we can't see, not by sight. This is kind of like what happens to Peter. Peter is on the boat with (laughs) some of the other disciples and there's this storm that kicks up and the wind is, is 
very powerful and, and there are waves. And then they see our Lord walking on the water towards the boat. And they cry out for fear because they think he's a ghost. And then Peter and, and Jesus says, be not afraid, it is I. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come out on the water with you. And Jesus says, come. And Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking on the water towards Jesus. This is a kind of a miraculous, but a very, um, very striking and physical example of what it means to walk by faith, not by sight. According to Peter's human nature, according to his senses and everything that his mind tells him about the situation, about his own possibilities, it's impossible to walk on water. No one can walk on water. And yet Jesus is doing it and he's come to believe in Jesus' power, not just for things that Jesus can do himself, but things that Jesus can help others do. And so Peter, with a conviction of something that he can't see, the power of Jesus and Jesus' ability to help him share in that power. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come out on the water with you. And Peter starts doing something totally impossible for him without our Lord's help. He's walking on the water. But then the scripture tells us, you know, he, he, he sees, he, he stops looking at Jesus. He stops walking by faith. He starts using his eyes and his senses and his feelings instead of his faith, which is in his conviction in his mind. And he sees the wind and he sees the waves and he gets scared and he starts to fall immediately and he cries out, save Lord. And Jesus grabs him and brings it back to the boat. Well, this is us. Jesus comes to meet us in the storms and in the winds of our life. And he's in the midst of them. And like Peter, we can say, Lord, help me walk through this. Help me do something impossible for me to stay calm, to be of good courage, to keep my hope, to keep going forward, even though I'm going through this difficulty, even though I'm going through this thing that, that I can't wrap my mind around, perhaps. In the beginning of the 20th century, there was a um, very influential theologian, a Dominican Thomist, Gary Gou Lagrange was his name, Reginald Gary Gou Lagrange. And he wrote uh, many books, and um, he's a very uh, thorough uh, and insightful theologian. And one of the books I, I was reading recently, and I came across a passage which I thought is particularly helpful for, for the times that we're living through. The book is called Providence, and in it, Gary Goulagrange goes through the writings of St. Thomas and uh, other theologians, also, of course, sacred scripture and, and the teachings of the church, to kind of talk about what divine providence is and how we should relate to it. And this is the passage I came across that I thought it would be it would be helpful to pray with and to reflect on. The section is called Why We Should Abandon Ourselves to Divine Providence. Why we should abandon ourselves to divine providence. The answer of every Christian will be that the reason lies in the wisdom and goodness of providence. And so what does providence mean? Well, providence is God's governance of the world. And so since God is good and wise, his governance of the world is good and wise. And for Gary Goulagrange and for St. Thomas, well, what does governance mean? Right? What does it mean to govern something? To govern something means that you are the authority that can guide the thing to its end, right? Can can help it reach its good end or its conclusion. And so to this question, why we should abandon ourselves to divine providence, right? Why should we do this? Gary Goulagrand says, every Christian will say that we will, that we should abandon ourselves to, God, to divine providence because providence is good. God's governance is good and wise. Why? Because God is good and wise. This is very true, he goes on. Nevertheless, if we are to have a proper understanding of the subject, if we are to avoid the error of the quietists in renouncing more or less the virtue of hope and the struggle necessary for salvation, if we are to avoid also the other extreme of disquiet, precipitation, and a feverish, fruitless agitation, 
it is expedient for us to lay down four principles already somewhat accessible to natural reason and clearly set forth in Revelation as found in Scripture. And so Gary Gulerunch points out two kind of extremes that we could take towards our attitude towards divine providence. One extreme is the extreme of what he calls the quietists. And quietists were people who had a kind of exaggerated, um, an exaggerated sense of God's activity. And so they thought, well, God is good. God is all powerful. God is provident, right? He's in charge. And so it really doesn't matter what we do, right? So we can just like lay around and take it easy. And no matter what we do, God's going to bring everything to a good end. And so we could be lazy and kind of presumptuous. It is the sin of presumption, a false version of hope. We could be presumptuous about our own salvation and about the end to which God will bring uh, the world and everything. The other extreme, I think, is, is probably for most of us, right? Probably for most of us, the other extreme is the extreme that we fall into, which is not having enough trust in God's providence, not having enough trust in God's plan and in God's goodness. And this leads to disquiet, precipitation, feverish, fruitless agitation. And this happens when we think that God's not really in charge or we're tempted to think that God's not really good. And we put it on ourselves to save ourselves or put it on ourselves to make the world right without the help of God or without trusting in the plan of God. And this leads to, of course, a kind of anxious, worried uh, attitude and a kind of frenetic activity, right? That we do things thinking that everything uh, is on us, that we're responsible for the outcome. And so he says, we're going to lay out four principles which, which help us understand why we should abandon ourselves to the divine providence, which avoid quietism on the one hand and anxiety on the other. The first of these principles is that everything which comes to pass has been foreseen by God from all eternity and has been willed or at least permitted by him. That's a comforting thought, and that's true. Everything that happens... God knows. And everything that happens has either been willed by God or permitted by God. Nothing comes to pass, either in the material or in the spiritual world, but that God has foreseen it from all eternity. Because with him there is no passing from ignorance to knowledge as with us, and he has nothing to learn from events as they occur. Not only has God foreseen everything that is happening now or will happen in the future, but whatever reality and goodness there is in these things, He has willed. And whatever evil or moral disorder is in them, He has merely permitted. Holy Scripture is explicit on this point, and as the councils have declared, no room is, no room is left for doubt in the matter." And so this is a matter that pertains to our faith. If we're, if we're believing Catholics, we believe in the Bible, we believe in tradition, we believe in the church's authority, then this is part of our faith. This is part of the Catholic faith. Namely, that God knows everything and he's foreseen it all from eternity outside of time. And that everything that's good in the world, in people, the good that they do, the good that they are, has been directly willed by God. God is responsible for all the goodness in the world. And anything that's evil or wrong with people or with the world, evil that they do, evil that they suffer, is also permitted by God. Now, why it's permitted will come to a certain, will come to um, soon. But this also is super important that it's not like it's not like God's up there saying, well, I hope this goes this way. And, oh, no, it didn't. No, what am I going to do now? It's not like God's worried. God is in charge. And and if if people do bad things, he incorporates it into his plan. We'll see this in a minute. The second principle is that nothing can be willed or permitted by God that does not contribute to the end he purposed in creating which is the manifestation of his goodness and infinite perfections and the glory of the God-man Jesus Christ, his only Son. This is another powerful principle, Lord, that it, it helps us to think about. 
Nothing can be willed or permitted by God that does not contribute to the end he had in creating, which is the manifestation of his goodness and the glory of the God-man, Jesus Christ. What does this mean? It means that if anything bad happens, eventually, because God let it happen, he's going to turn it into something good. It's going to manifest somehow his goodness. And your goodness, Lord, is goodness not just for yourself, but it's your goodness for all of us because you love us. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. Our Lord tells us all the time, I love you. Which means he wants our good. Which means that if he permits evil to happen in the world, eventually it's going to be turned in his plan, if he permits it to happen, eventually it's going to be turned somehow into goodness. In addition to these two principles, Gary Gu Lagrange goes on, there is a third which St. Paul states in this way. We know that to them that love God, all things work together unto good. To such as, according to his purpose, are called to be saints. St. Saint Josemaria liked to summarize this, this, this line of St. Paul. Uh, it's in Romans 8, verse 28, with a Latin expression, omnia in bonum, all things unto the good. Right? All things work unto the good for those who love God. Omnia and bonum. Gary Gu goes on to comment. God sees to it that everything contributes to their spiritual welfare. Not only the grace he bestows on them, not only those natural qualities he endows them with, but sickness too, and contradictions and reverses. As St. Augustine tells us, even their very sins, which God only permits in order to lead them onto a truer humility, and thereby to a purer love. It was in this way that he permitted the threefold denial of St. Peter to make the great apostle more humble, more mistrustful of self, and by this very means become stronger and trust more in the divine mercy. And so St. Augustine, a wonderful saint, a wonderful theologian, is very daring here, right? St. Paul says, St. Paul says, all things work unto the good, for those who love God. And St. Augustine takes it a step further and adds in Latin, Aetium peccata, even their sins, even their lacks of love. If we're trying to love God, if we're committed to God, if we're trying to be good and and uh, renounce our sins when, when we see them, even those sins, even those lacks of love, God turns into good. And Gary Goulagrange gives a reason, you know, uh, uh, an example here that, that Augustine gives. You know, how do our sins turn unto our good? Well, they make us more humble. They show us that we're not perfect. They show us that we need God. And therefore they and thereby they purify our love. Another way that our sins work unto our good is that without our sins we wouldn't experience mercy. We wouldn't experience God's forgiveness. That wonderful boon, that wonderful gift of being forgiven by God. These first three principles may therefore be summed up in this way. Nothing comes to pass but that God has foreseen it, willed it, or at least permitted it. He wills nothing, permits nothing, unless for the manifestation of his goodness and infinite perfections, for the glory of his Son, and for the welfare of those that love him. In view of these three principles, it is evident that our trust in providence is cannot be too childlike, too steadfast. Indeed, we may go further and say that this trust in providence should be as blind as our faith, the object of which is those mysteries that are non-evident and unseen. Faith is the conviction of things unseen. For we are certain beforehand that providence is directing all things infallibly to a good purpose, and we are more convinced of the rectitude of his designs than we are the best of our own intentions. Therefore, in abandoning ourselves to God, all we have to fear is that our submission will not be wholehearted enough. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Why? Because we're provident. 
because we can turn evil and difficulty to your good because everything that happens, we know it's happening and we love you. And everything that happens, we're either willing it directly or we're permitting it to bring a good out of it afterwards. And so Gary Gulagrange makes the conclusion that, you know, the only thing we should worry about is not trusting God enough. The only thing we should fear is that our acceptance and our abandonment to divine providence is not wholehearted enough. That said, however, we, um, we have one last principle left. In view of quietism, however, this last sentence obliges us to lay down a fourth principle, no less certain than the principles that have proceeded. And so, just a reminder, the quietists are those who say, okay, God knows everything, God wills everything for the good, and so I have no part to play, right? I can just, <laughs> I can just take it easy and watch things unfold, and even sin, and who cares? The principle is that obviously self-abandonment does not dispense us from doing everything in our power to fulfill God's will, as made known in the commandments and counsels, and in the events of life. This is what he'll later call God's expressed will. Right? The fact that God is provident doesn't mean that we that we get a free pass. We're bound um, to fulfill God's expressed will. And God's will is expressed for us in the commandments. So the Ten Commandments, the, that moral law that God gave to us. In the, in the Great Commandment, you, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, your neighbor as yourself. In the new commandment, right, love one another as I have loved you. And then in all the commandments, the moral uh, and and um, the moral and ecclesiastical commandments that we get through scripture and, and through the church. And then his will is also expressed to us, not, not just in the commandments, but in the spirit of the councils, right, living obedience, chastity, according to our state in life. And poverty, right? Detachment from goods, detachment from, from the world so that we can be attached to others and attached to God in the right way. As long as we have the sincere desire to carry out his will that is made known from day to day, again, made known in the spirit of the councils, in the commandments, and in the circumstances of our, of our life, we can and indeed we must abandon ourselves for the rest to the divine will of good pleasure, no matter how mysterious it may be, and thus avoid a useless disquiet and mere agitation. And so the divine will of good pleasure is what God merely permits. And so that's the thing that can be mysterious, right? Why this cross? Why this pandemic? Why this economic re uh, recession? Why this persecution? Why this war? Why this corruption in the church? We don't know why God is permitting it. We know that he's not willing it directly because they're evils, right? But he's permitting it. And so that we have to leave in the hands of providence with a great sense of trust and a great sense of, ban of abandonment. So we avoid useless disquiet and agitation, right? What good does worrying do about anything? Right? Jesus says this in the, in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, which one of you by worrying can add a cubit to your stature? What good does worrying do about anything? On the contrary, uh, trusting God does a heck of a lot of good. Praying to God does a, does a world of good. Why? Because when we trust God, well, then we can be peaceful for others. We can, we can get our focus off of fear and off of ourselves and on to what actually needs to be done. And we can be a source of, of peace and confidence for other people who, who perhaps have less faith, faith than us, who perhaps need a, a calm and, and steady presence in their life. Right? Trusting God and praying actually helps the situation because it makes us more capable of handling the situation and of helping others. And what else are we supposed to do? Right? Except, except, except the situation is something permitted by God and then make the best of it with a lot of hope, a lot of confidence in God. This fourth principle is expressed in equivalent terms by the in, in equivalent terms by the Council of Trent, when it declares that we must all have firm hope in God's assistance and put our trust in Him, being careful at the same time to keep His commandments. As the well known proverb has it, do what you ought, come what 
may. Some people say, pray as if everything depends on God and act as if everything depends on you. I kind of like that phrase, but I think it's better to say pray and act as if everything depends on God. Because it does, right? And acting as if everything depends on God is not to act with less responsibility. It's to act it's to act w- with greater trust, right? Was going to is going to help us act more generously. We can we can risk acting in ways that we would never we would never think about acting uh, if we didn't have trust that God was helping us to do this. Right? We can act with much more confidence and therefore much more generously if we realize that even our action depends on God, even our action, our own responsibility, the things that God has made us kind of semi-provident over depend on him. We go to Our Lady. Our Lady had moments of consternation in her life, moments of great anxiety, moments of suffering, sorrow, trial, and through it all she trusted in our Lord. And so we go to her, Virgin Most Faithful, teach us to trust, teach us to have the sense not to let our hearts be troubled, because we trust in God and we trust in your Son, and also Our Lady, we trust in you. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspirations which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I ask your help to put them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.